Good morning. Hey guys, come uh, in if you can hear me. Do make your way back to your seats. Right, guys, good morning. Hey, so good to see you all again. So good to be back. Um, Gemma, absolutely love that worship time. I just felt, before anything else, just that line in that song, um, I will never let you down. Um, and I specifically felt for someone here this morning that uh, that's something that needs to be spoken over your life, um, that Jesus, he is enough, and he is never, ever, ever, ever going to let you down. So again, if you want to have a chat about that, I'd love to afterwards. But um, good to be back. It's going to be the hottest day of the year, supposedly, today. So uh, nice and cool in here. It's barbecue weather. Uh, yeah, let's give a clap for that sunshine. <laughs> Being a Kiwi and barbecues. But... Um, Today, guys, what we're going to do is we are continuing our series looking at this prophet called Elijah. And today what we're going to do is we're going to meet a guy who, who takes over from him. Um, no confusion on the name. His name is Elisha. But so what? You know, what difference does the calling of a prophet, it was probably about nearly 3,000 years ago, what difference does that have for you and me sitting here in East London today? You see, I think this makes all the difference in the world, and I'll tell you why. It, it kind of leads to these massive questions that we all ask, you know, what am I here for? Uh, what do I do? Should I, should I do this job? Uh, it leads to the question, you know, I have got one shot on planet Earth. I want to make my life count. And if you guys are here today and you're asking those questions, um, for some of you, I think you're here today and you've got some decisions that you need to make in your life you have come to the right spot because God, he wants to speak directly into that this morning um, and we're going to unpack the word. Now, we've only got three verses today. It's, it's one of these passages that the deeper you dig, the more you find. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through verse by verse by verse and then there's going to be two questions I want us to unpack. Uh, first question we're going to look at is who are you raising up? And the second question is, what's God raising up in you? What's his, uh, what's his plan for you? So if you've got your Bibles, we are still in 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, and we're picking up from verse 19. And it says this, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Japhat. Now, to help visualize this, I've got a, a map of Israel up on the screen, and it's a little bit hard to see, but there's two stars, one star way up the top, and one star way up the, down the bottom. And we heard last week that Elijah, he was faring for his life, and he fled from this place called Jezreel. It's way up the top. It's near Galilee. And up there, you've got King Ahab. He is a bad king. Uh, you've got Queen Jezebel. She is a bad queen. And so he goes running all the way down to the bottom. Little star at the bottom. It's what we know as the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and he ends up on this place called Mount Horeb. And uh, on there, God comes, he encounters him, he speaks to him in a small whisper, and kind of lets him know that, hey, you're not alone, I'm still with you, I'm still for you, and he tells him to go all the way back to where he'd come from. And so from the bottom, he goes and he travels 300 miles north again to a place called Abel Mahola, which ironically is only about 10 miles from where he fled in the first place. And so he goes back and he goes looking for this guy called Elisha. And then it says this next bit. It says, he, Elisha, was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So he gets there, and he finds Elisha plowing uh, for the non-farmers among us uh, in London. Well, that means he's breaking up the soil. He's getting it ready for planting. And it says, driving the last pair was Elisha. So what? Well, you see, the Bible's got this beautiful way of getting across so much in such a few words. Uh, that uh, 20, 20, uh, 12 yoke, that means 12 pairs. That's 24 cows. That's a lot of cows. And driving the last pair, the only way you did that is if you owned a lot of them. Or, or the only way you did that is if you were the supervisor of all of them. And so in four words, we learn that this young man, Elisha, he's probably got a lot of money. He's got a good job. He's got a lot of wealth. And it goes on and it says, uh, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. 
Now, um, uh, in New Zealand, we uh, greet each other by pressing noses. I know that's probably a little bit weird. It's called a hongi. But uh, going up to someone and you've got your coat and you just go throw it over their shoulders. You know, what, what's with that? Well, back then, uh, prophets were recognized by their cloaks. It, it's a little bit like how we would uh, be able to recognize a priest. And so this, this symbolic act of Throwing this cloak on Elisha's shoulders, it was probably big, it was heavy, it was probably hairy camel hair, probably stank because Elijah's been running for the past three years. He goes and chucks it on his shoulders, and he's basically saying, hey, you're next. Uh, You're next. You are going to pick up where I left off. And then uh, we read uh, verse 20, we're up to now, it says this, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Now, um, straight off, Elisha knew what the cost was. You know, he had to leave his mum and dad. He had to leave his job. He had to leave everything behind. And he goes, okay, uh, Elijah, I'm going to come. But do you mind if I just go say bye to my mum and dad? Uh, can I kiss them goodbye? And this little line, go back, It doesn't seem to make much sense what Elijah's saying. It it doesn't actually translate that well, but he's basically saying, hey, you go ahead. Uh, This isn't me telling you what to do. This is God calling you. This is between you and God. God. So, hey, you want to do that? I'm not going to stop you. And so it says, Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Now, Elisha, this guy, he goes all in. Uh, there, he goes, all. there is no change in your mind when you've gone and burnt your plow and cooked your cows. And uh, as a New Zealander, I love a good barbecue. Like, uh, it's, in, it's in my Bible that I uh, barbecue 365 days of the year. But this guy, Elisha, he takes it to a whole new level. Like, he's got two ox, two cows. We call them two beasts back home. And he barbecues these two cows. He has a massive feast. It would have been bigger, they say, than any wedding feast of the day. And then he has it, and then it says it. So it finishes off saying, he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Now, two things we're going to unpack from this passage. Um, We're going to unpack the raising up of Elisha, and we're going to unpack the calling of Elisha. Now, as elders, for those of you that have been coming, or if this is your first time, you, you often hear us say from the front, we want to raise up others. We want to raise up others. That The vision of East End Church, we want to see uh, the East End of London eternally changed, eternally transformed by Jesus and for Jesus. But that's not going to happen by the four of us. Uh, that's not going to happen by every single one of us sitting in this room. And uh, a guy called Andy Stanley, he's a pastor in the States, he once said this, and I absolutely love it, he said this, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. Uh, Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. And it's similar to a Chinese proverb, it says, if you're planting for a year, plant grain. Uh, If you're planting for a decade, well, go plant trees. But if you're planting for a century, you go plant people. And you see here that the measure of Elijah's success, it wasn't 14 miracles that he had a hand in, some of which we've looked at. The, The true measure of Elijah's success was seeing this next generation come up, do more, run further, go faster uh, than he had ever done, hoped or dreamed for. And what is absolutely fascinating, the, the, the amazing uh, what's in the word, is at the end of Elijah's life, uh, he's there and Elisha comes to him and he says, hey, I want a double portion of your spirit. Basically saying, I want to be as effective as you were. And where Elijah did 14 miracles, double portion, those of you quick at maths, Elisha, he did exactly 28 He did double the number of miracles recorded that Elijah Elijah did. Now, over half term, um, we went away to Wales for a family holiday. It was uh, partly for my birthday. And 
It's funny how Wales is so much like New Zealand. You've got uh, probably more sheep than you've got people. Uh, you've got people, you can't really understand the accent. Um, blank faces, maybe that's what's going on with my accent. But you go there, and on my actual birthday, I had uh, a 40-minute daddy date with Lily, a 40-minute daddy date with Leo, my uh, son, and a 40-minute daddy date with Caleb. No, no guessing what my age was. Um, but you see, a, a, and part of it is they just got to figure out, what do I want to do with dad for those 40 minutes? And it was absolutely brilliant. But you see, the thing that struck me and has really been playing in my head ever since is that as a dad, as a dad, it's going to be less about what I do and more about who I raise. Uh, it's going to be less about what I do and more about who I raise. You see, I've got 168 hours in a week. My kids, they're going to have 504. That, that I can't walk into a school and talk to eight-year-old girls but actually, by raising my kids, I can. That, that through, through Lily, uh, instructing her in the ways of the Lord, praying for her, having time with her, uh, her, her influence as she goes into school. Leo going into nursery with four-year-old boys, hearing some of the stuff, saying to his teachers, do you know Jesus? Uh, and then, it, yeah, I won't go on the conversation after that. But actually, by investing in raising up of my kids, it's going to have far more impact than me just trying to do, 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 do. And... You see, it's the same story as an elder. Uh, and I have far from got this sorted. I've far from got this sorted, guys. But uh, over the years, I've had the privilege of, of, of leading this church and shepherding this church. The more I am realizing, it's less about what I do, and it's more about who I raise. Uh, it's less about what I do and more about who I raise. Less of me, more of him. And you see, my legacy, I want my legacy to be my family on fire for Jesus, my friends on fire for Jesus, my church on fire for Jesus. But you know what? This can take a long time. So we're talking about raising up. Do you want to know how long it took from the time Elisha was called here to when he took over from Elijah? It was 18 years. Okay? You know, Elisha would have laughed if you'd said you're an overnight success. And uh, imagine 18 years later, you know, his parents, they're still on the farm, they've got the neighbors over like you do, uh, conversation turns to what your kids are doing now like it does, and, and someone says, oh yeah, Johnny, yeah, oh, wow, he's, he's just become captain of the guard. And they're like, oh wow, brilliant, that, that's amazing, thought he'd do that. Uh, hey, hey, what, Peter, oh yeah, yeah, Peter, he, he's just become the chief priest. Oh, good man, good man. Hey, what about, what, what's Elisha up to the... I don't think we've seen Elisha 18 years ago since we had that massive feast. And his mum and dad go, oh, he's, uh, he's still Elijah's servant. He's, he's um, washing his hands. He's, he's helping get him ready. He's just shadowing him. You'd be like, what? 18 years. And you see, I'm not sure. Our, our on-demand generation, do we have the patience of 18 years like Elisha? That, that us itchy feet Christians, we often start thinking, if this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen, I am off to greener pastures doing something a little bit more exciting. But you see what Elisha shows us here, he spent 18 years being mentored, being raised, uh, creating a legacy. And the reason is the greater the doing, and he did a whole lot, the more important the becoming. Uh, the greater the doing, and Elisha did a whole lot, the more important the becoming. And that's kind of what we're going to touch on. Second question, what this passage is really about is the calling of Elisha. And it, it kind of has two parts. It's got the call to be something, which is the same for every single one of us. And it's got the call to do something, which is specific or it's unique to you. So your life, you're, you're called to be something, and you're called to do something. And it goes right back to this question of, you know, why am I here? And a long time ago, I remember people often used to talk about finding God's will for your life. As a term in church, finding God's will, that the way to pack out a church was either to preach on finding God's will for your life or relationships, and everybody came along to those ones. But at times, it seemed a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. But you see, this is how amazing God is. For those big questions, he doesn't want to leave you in the dark. Uh, he doesn't want to leave you looking for a needle in a haystack. And every single one of you can leave here today, like Elisha, having an answer to the question, why am I here and what's God's plan for me? 
10 minutes, we're going to cover that one off. Why am I here and what's God's plan for me? And I want to jump to Colossians 1, 16. It's talking about Jesus. And it says this. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. So by Jesus and for Jesus. Uh, we are here because of him, made by him, and we are here for him. We, we were made by a person, and we are here for a person. And so uh, you say, what's God's plan for my life? It's to know him and to make him known. Simple as that. To know Jesus and to make Jesus known. That is God's plan for my life, to, to become something more like Jesus and to do something to make him known. But it's kind of at this point, you go, hold up, Steve, don't give me such a spiritual answer. Uh, I, I want to know, should I change jobs? Uh, I want to know, how long do I stay in London? I want to know, should I continue with this relationship? Don't give me this spiritual waffle mumble jumble about knowing Jesus and making him known. But you see, let's play it forward a little bit. What, what if you've got a decision to make? God, he sends you a letter. He says, I want you to take this job. Great decision made, but you go and do it. But two years later, you still don't really know why you're here. You, you still don't really know what life's all about. And the reason is it's not about the individual assignment, but it's about the big picture. And the problem is we often try and connect God's will or God's plan to our location, to our job, or to relationship. We try and connect it there. We try and connect the, the will of God to a specific question or a specific decision. But God's saying, hey, you were created for something far, far bigger than knowing what job to do, knowing what to do in a relationship, knowing where to send your kids to school. Uh, you were created by Jesus and through your life to bring glory to him and point others to him. But you see, it's still a valid question. Okay, I uh, become like Jesus. I kind of get that bit. Okay, I, I, I can see what he's like, and I'm gonna, uh, I can become like Jesus. But, but what do I do? Uh, how do I make him know? And like Elisha, what is God's call for my specific life? If you jump to Colossians 3.17, it says this. And whatever you do, that's a pretty big statement. Ah, cat, far catchy. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, whatever you do, that seems to me, I don't know what you're hearing, I hear a pretty big doorway. Uh, I hear a pretty big doorway, and Paul is basically saying, it's, it's less about what you do, and it's more about why you do it. it. It's less about what you do, and it's more about why you do it, to know him and to make him known. That the reason you were created, it wasn't for a specific job. It wasn't to uh, uh, even plant churches. It wasn't to work for the church. The, the reason you were created, the reason God breathed life into your lungs, wasn't to work for God, but it was to walk with God. It, it wasn't to be an expert on God, but it was to walk with God. And, and one of my biggest worries is I get so caught up in doing, 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 that I forget my being. I forget the joy of just walking with my Father, with my Savior. And I'll be honest, you know, sometimes I, I worry that I get too familiar with church. Uh, it's a little bit like my work. I can go to work and I can uh, spend my day with um, dealing with hundreds of billions of pounds and in a way the zeros on the end can start to lose a little bit of their significance or, or a heart surgeon operating on hearts every day, they can, they can start to lose the wonder of what they are doing. You see, and I don't want to become that banker. I don't want to become that heart surgeon that in chasing after knowledge of God, I forget the joy of just walking with them and having time with them. You see, I, I want the pages of this book to lead me to the person, which is Jesus. It is all about him. Jesus is enough. Now, what this all means is that when you then face those big decisions, should I change jobs? Uh, should I, where should I send my kids to school? Um, should I start a startup uh, for us? Should, should we move from New Zealand to the UK? You, you can get so hung up on, am I making the right decision? But Paul is basically saying, if you get that frame right, 
to know him and to make him known. If you get that frame right, to know him and to make him known, hey, God wants to release you into uh, what he's gifted you in, what you're passionate about, what you're called to do. That There is a wide door. There might even be multiple doors you can go through. And whether it is that job or that job, in both of them, I am going to know Jesus and I'm going to make him known. And you see another guy, he once said this. He said, it's not what a man does which determines if his work is sacred or secular. It's why he does it. You see, and, and that means, like Elisha, you can walk into drama school, you can walk into a building site, you can walk into a bank, you can walk into a shop, and in all of those places and situations, you can do a God-honoring thing with your life to know Jesus and to make him known. Because, you see, at my team meeting on Monday, I didn't say right next on the agenda, we've got Pastor Tom. Tom, he's come to talk to us about Jesus. <laughs> no. He didn't come. He, he's not coming to your school. He's not coming to your client. That the way I bring that in is when people say to me in my team meeting, what did you do in the weekend? I went to church and we spoke about this. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, you, each of you are in a place with people that others of us aren't. And in those places and in those um, positions, you can know Jesus and you can make him known. And you see, I remember when I was young, often we'd be in small groups and people would be talking about what they want to do when they grow up. And someone would say, I want to be a worship leader, or I want to uh, be a teacher, or I want to work for a charity, or I, I, I want to plan a church. And I remember, and this is probably more my insecurity, but I remember sitting there, and for me, I just wanted to work in finance. I, I, I wanted to work in a bank, but, but back then there was kind of this culture, maybe there is now, that it didn't seem a very Christian thing to say. It, it didn't seem to be a very Christian industry to go and work in. But you see, for me, it was a bigger deal to work at Goldman Sachs than it would have been at that time to work for the church. Uh, and I stand by that because, for me, I am able to reach some people that others of you can't, and you are able to reach people that I can't. That, that each of you, guys, you've got a calling in this world. You've got a mission to be like Jesus. But don't get hung up on the doing. It took Peter a lifetime to figure out what God call of God looked like in his life. You know, don't get caught up on the doing that you forget the primary thing, and that's what God's called you to be. And really practically, I just felt this morning, some of you are facing those big decisions. You're at a crossroad like Elisha. Should I follow? Should I not? And really practically, questions I'd throw at you to ask yourself. Get, get someone to come and say, what do they affirm in your life? What do they see in your life? Uh, what are you passionate about? What, what keeps you up at night? What does East London need? What does East End Church need? Uh, if you didn't have to worry about being paid, what would you do with your time? How about you start there? Start there and see where you go. Now, I want to start finishing up. And as I do, I just want to pray Holy Spirit is going to come and he is going to start prompting and bubbling uh, thoughts. He's going to start bubbling stuff up in your life. And this is just a chance. Uh, response is never between what I say. This is God just coming and speaking to you. And I just want to pray as we finish up. It's a lovely day. We're going to go out and enjoy ourselves. But these are things I just love you just to think about and pray about. Um, might be a chance where you just want someone else to come and, and speak to you as well. But you see, for some of you, I felt that you need to um, burn the plow and kill the ox. You need to burn the plow and kill the ox. That for too long you have been uh, sitting with one foot in and one foot out. You've been sitting on the fence. I think the word Evans brought a couple of weeks ago just really has been resounding with me when I, I, I read this. That actually one hand raised and worshipped and another hand clenched. And this morning there is a day, there is an opportunity to say, like Elisha, Jesus, I am going all in. Uh, I am going all in, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it costs, no matter what it feels. I am going to follow you. And, and it may mean that there's stuff in your life that you need to move on from. Uh, you need to burn that plow. You need to kill that ox. Maybe it is a, a toxic relationship. Maybe it is unhealthy thinking. Maybe it is some of those habits. But it's an opportunity to say, right, Jesus, I am going all in. And that's not on your strength. That's on his strength. You see, the second one, and this is for me, if I had to choose what's spoken to me most, I need to stop looking at working for God and I need to start walking with him more. <laughs> that, that actually it's about, it, it, it's humbling yourself and slowing down and actually slowing down and saying, more important than the doing is being. 
Uh, and so there's a chance for some of you just to say that. Um, for all of us, I think the challenge like Elijah, uh, I had to get that at one point, Elijah, but who are you raising up and who are you investing in? Uh, and, and sometimes that's not just a quick fix. Elisha, it took him 18 years. And it might not have been continuous, it might have been off and on, but having those people in your life that are speaking into you, but also that you're saying, right, I'm in, the, I'm in it for the long haul with you. <laughs> I am going to journey in this with you. And then the very, very last one, if you're here this morning and you are at a crossroad in your life and you've got a decision you need to make and you don't know what to do and you're saying, God, show me what your plan is, I just want to encourage you that God would say he has a plan for you and he has a purpose for you. And he says that if you get that frame right to know me and to make me known, I'm going to be with you. <laughs> Whatever you do, wherever you go, you keep me at that center and... Uh, we're going to be a good team. And so, guys, I'm going to pray. Uh, I'm going to pray for all of you, whatever's going on in your heads. It's a chance now as well just for you to do business with your creator, to uh, throw him the questions which you're struggling with. And I trust and I believe that he's going to create a space where he's going to speak into that. So, Father, I thank you for... Um, oh, we just love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you. The deeper we dig, the more we find. And uh, at the center of it is you, Jesus. Uh, everything we've been singing about your, your, your salvation uh, your grace, your sufficient and I want to pray for people here this morning that you will encourage us each to uh, stay close to you that will focus uh, primarily on uh, walking with you as you've created us to be I, I want to pray for anyone here at a crossroad that you will just speak clearly to them, uh, give them that peace Put people around them that will help them uh, make those decisions. And yeah, Jesus, we just want to see East London changed for you. We want to know you, and we want to make you known in everything we do. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.